Ben, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bay and the Georgetown University Organ Society for inviting me to give the talk here today. Uh, so I'm, I'm Ben Griffin. I am a uh, officer in the U.S. Army, currently stationed uh, at Fort Riley, Kansas, with the First Infantry Division. Uh, when we first made this tool, I was the Division Artillery Brigade S2, the intelligence officer. Uh, now I'm the collection manager for the division, the guy who managed the sensors. Uh, what I should note, of course, is though I'm an Army officer, this is an unofficial talk. Uh, everything that I say is my own opinion uh, and not reflective of the U.S. government, DOD, the Army, or um, First Infantry Division. Uh, and so what we want to talk about today is, is how kind of the body we recognized a problem with how upcoming technology was going to change the way we executed field artillery operations. Uh, and how that then needed to change when we thought about our counterfire procedures and the way that we approached uh, sensor to shooter linkages. Uh, and we have come with a board game to do this, uh, to train our personnel. Uh, and so as we go through that, I'd like to do a couple of things. Um, start off, I want to frame the problem uh, so we can all have sort of a common basis for uh, the, the logic we had as we approached this issue. Uh, so I take a little bit of history, kind of start with 1991 going to the present day. Um, top of the relevant systems to make sure everyone understands uh, what I mean when I say 2S-19, 2S-35, uh, both Russian artillery systems. I'm going to talk about the challenges as we saw them. Um, what exactly this new technology, these changes to uh, things like rates of fire and range of fire due to our operations. We're going to look at the design requirements, kind of what we thought we needed to do uh, to make this a useful training aid, something that uh, soldiers would want to take part in, that they'd want to play with, uh, while still getting across the actual training value uh, of, the, of the game itself. Um, I'm seeing this Jim drawing on the screen here. Uh, then looking at finally the, the counterfire of the game itself, talking about the rules that we have made for it um, and kind of what we are trying to do uh, in Oregon to make this a fun game, talk about the structure of it, talk about how the gameplay itself works, look at the mechanics behind it, uh, and then talk about what happened when we play tested this game. Uh, so we ran several sessions with prior to going to NTC. Um, so one ID was the first division to be the primary training audience at the National Training Center at Fort Irwin. Uh, this was back in September. Uh, and so that was an interesting exercise in of itself, uh, but then the way the training of this game played into that, uh, as well as into the warfare that we just completed uh, about a month ago. And I find kind of wrapping it up with a so what and looking at the, the ramifications for us for, from my perspective in the Army, uh, but then also kind of looking at ways we can use wargaming to train. All right, and so kind of start off looking at artillery since 1991. And I like this, this talk kind of starts or is taking place on the 30th anniversary, just after the 30th anniversary of the end of Desert Storm, uh, because that set the tone for a lot of what was to follow kind of in the coming years with regards to uh, fuel artillery in the US, but also fuel artillery with our adversaries. Uh, so looking at Desert Storm really is a validation of air land battle doctrine, right? The ability to integrate uh, what the Air Force is doing, uh, what the Navy is doing with their aircraft, uh, with forces in the ground, really effectively to have a, a very dynamic, a uh, very successful operation um, that inflicted a lot of casualties in the enemy, very few on the U.S., uh, and ended the war in, in pretty rapid and forceful fashion. Uh, what this thing did over the course of the 90s as the Army started to draw down was to de-emphasize the importance of traditional artillery. Uh, we saw a lot less emphasis placed on howitzers, um, on missiles, because we thought we could fill that gap uh, with the Air Force, with, with the Navy, and always have some sort of overhead cover uh, in a permissive environment to use them as supporting fires uh, over time. This persisted through the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And actually it made a lot of sense there because there really was not a pronounced air defense threat. Uh, and the scale of ground that was being covered by brigades, um, by battalions, was much larger than you can cover with artillery systems, right? And so you had brigades would have an entire province uh, of Afghanistan or Iraq uh, which meant that there was no way they'd be able to cover down on that with their single battalion's worth of howitzers. All right, so they have a total of 18 guns. They could not cover their territory, but the Air Force and the Navy could fill in uh, with all sorts of, you know, again, airborne assets to, to be able to do that. But as we started getting back into looking at large scale combat operations, uh, this doesn't work as well. And really, you know, hey, Ben, quick, yes. uh, I'm going to pause this recording for a second. 
And so large scale operations is the, the new thing that, that really in the eye, but all DOD is starting to look at uh, as we are shifting focus away from counterinsurgencies like we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and more towards how we counter a peer or a near peer threats uh, such as Russia or China. Um, in this though, the, the fire suddenly becomes much more important. And so a lot of the changes that were made to our fire structure in the 90s and the 2000s of cutting back on the number of batteries, uh, eliminating division artillery brigades, uh, now look like something we need to undo in, in retrospect, right? So the bodies have come back, uh, I think as of about 2016 is when they really started standing back up again. Uh, again, I was serving in one in 2019, 2020. Uh, but they still don't have any organic fires battalions underneath them. Uh, we're just looking at how to structure that. Uh, but again, recognizing that if we are in a large scale combat operation, we're going to need uh, a lot of indirect fires under the direct control of divisions uh, and of brigades in order to achieve the effects that we want. Uh, our adversaries looked at Desert Storm and took serious lessons of that as well. Uh, they saw our ability to, to build up a lot of equipment. Uh, and then what happens when we're allowed to more or less fly overhead without any kind of serious uh, interference, any kind of serious attack against our assets there. Uh, and so what you see Russia and China uh, over a period of 20 years recognize that they can't match us in the air, uh, but they can create their uh, integrated air defense systems to try and create a bubble uh, that becomes difficult for us to penetrate. They also invested very heavily in fires capabilities. Uh, Russia in particular has always had a very fuel artillery heavy mindset. Uh, they tend to maneuver in order to enable their fires. So they'll, they'll move ground forces forward, move fires behind them, use artillery then to pound whatever is in front of them in the dust, then move forward again, move the fires up again, uh, kind of rinse, wash, repeat. Uh, so they tend to feel a whole lot more in the way of uh, artillery battalions than we do. So as we've looked at these exercises we've done in 1ID, typically what we've seen is the op four, uh, in this case, the Novians, uh, who are the, the fictional force that we fight, will tend to have at least six, uh, likely seven battalions of howitzers to every one that we have in 1ID. Uh, rocket battalions tend to be about e equal. Uh, those typically cost a little bit more, and so that's why we see that there. Uh, I'm going to pause here quickly for any questions on this before I look at some of the key systems. So Ben, the only question we have is, was it also the case that in Afghanistan and Iraq, there was less of a problem with mobility of ammunition and logistics? I think that's, that's fair, right? We didn't have a whole lot of challenges to our rear areas there. I mean, convoys were struck a lot as they're moving through, but we could fly in supplies as we needed, uh, so in Afghanistan, uh, and even as they're passing through um, you know, some of the passes in the country that worked pretty well, same thing with Iraq as they're coming in from Kuwait, very little interference there. Uh, I think if you're looking at a, a LISCO environment, looking at like a Swalky Gap scenario, uh, that becomes a lot more difficult uh, with some longer supply lines, um, A, some threats to them in the Atlantic as we're getting them from the U.S. over to Europe, uh, but then also once we're in theater, uh, with the amount of fire systems that you see, uh, you know, a nation like Russia possesses the amount of uh, fear of missiles, the amount of rockets they have, they would be able to do a lot more to disrupt that. And what we kind of found through exercises is, you know, logistics is three days away, right? And so you need, so if you have an impact on logistics today, that's really gonna be felt in about 72 hours, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but that means then if they focus on supplies at the right point in time, they can have a outsized impact on either our offense, defense operations uh, in order to shape what they're trying to do. So, go ahead, Ben. Okay. So what I want to do quickly here is cover some of the, the key systems that we're talking about. And you know, for the purpose of this, this board game, we, we kind of simplified it. We left logistics out of the game, uh, although we made it modifiable. So we'll get to that uh, in a few slides here. We really focused in on self-propelled howitzers and ISR systems in order to really emphasize that sensor to shooter linkage that we were talking about. Um, so the current gen, the, the current ones that are most commonly out there, you have the 2S19, uh, which is the primary recipe up here, uh, and the M109 Paladin uh, that you see down here. Uh, and they're really fairly similar uh, as far as what they can do. They both can shoot about 29 kilometers. They both shoot anywhere from three to four rounds per minute. Uh, and when they decide it's time to leave where they're at and displace, it takes about one minute to do that. Um, so fairly quick. Again, shoot and scoot has become very important here. You know, long gone are days of artillery. You had to have, you know, old bull and team of mules to be able to move 
uh, your cannons after they shot. Uh, now they move in, occupy, fire, and leave fairly quickly. Uh, but given the ranges involved, that's still not a huge problem for the counterfire. But when we look at the next generation, the ones that are starting to be fielded now and will be in the near future, this becomes a, a much larger issue. Um, and so we have first the 2S35, uh, which is the next generation Russian system. And then we have the extended range cannon artillery, which is currently being tested here uh, in the US. And, and I should note, uh, in December, the IRC was able to hit a target uh, at 70 kilometers away, successfully testing the system. Um, and so that's the right now planned kind of max range for both of those. Um, and they both are going to have a rate of fire of anywhere from 12 to 15 rounds per minute. Uh, and they still are able to displace in one minute. Uh, but this represents a pretty substantial change uh, to what we see then in the field artillery environment. We see in this possible artillery duel, these counterfire battles we're going to have. Um, and so just to kind of put this into context, starting with the range, right? So if we're sitting in Georgetown um, with the present day systems, again, the 2S19s uh, and the Paladins, uh, you can range kind of just short of Manassas, uh, you know, get most of the North Virginia area uh, and, you know, out to Gaithersburg here in Maryland. Uh, if we were to be using the 2S19s or the IRCAs, uh, you'd be able to range Baltimore uh, from Georgetown University. Uh, and all, you know, almost all the way down to Fredericksburg. Uh, so that is a, a pretty huge leap forward. The other key part of this though too is the rate of fire. Uh, so presently you're looking at, if you have a battery, uh, a battery is usually about six guns, uh, 18 to 24 rounds in a minute. Uh, and this matters when talking about firing orders. Um, so a firing order is what you give when you're you know, giving the fire mission out, telling how many rounds to shoot in order to destroy the target you're shooting at. Uh, typically wants to be a battery three, a battery six, um, which means then that each gun in the battery would shoot three or six rounds. Um, so a, a battery three would take a minute, uh, a battery six would take two minutes with the current generation um, of systems out there. As we start fueling those next gen systems though, uh, that goes to 60 to 70 rounds per battery per minute um, with each gun in effect, able to replicate a battery three in a minute all by itself. Um, so that is a vast increase in the amount of rounds um, and in again, just the volume of fires and the rate of fire uh, that you could potentially run into uh, as we are looking at the, the future battle, those looking at these large scale combat operations. Additionally, uh, to make it even more challenging, that means these rounds can be flying for longer because they could be flying from further away, right? So that means that we pick them up later with radar, uh, and then that our time to respond uh, becomes less. Presently, you know, in order to successfully have a counterfire mission, you need to get the rounds back on the, the point of origin, uh, the proof site, within about five minutes. Uh, and that is really kind of stretching it if the enemy is on their game and really shooting and scooting. Uh, with longer flight times, that takes away some of that time because the rounds are already in the air uh, and the detection is late. So we're looking at the ability to shoot and scoot while both of them displace within one minute. Um, it is possible that a 2S35 or an IRCA battery could have fired the equivalent of a present day battery three and move from the area before you even detect that first round coming towards you. Um, so that drastically changed what you need to look at for counter fire. And then finally, the depth of the fight. Um, because they can shoot from so far away, that gives uh, enemy commanders and friendly commanders a lot of options. Um, so they have the ability then to position cannons further back uh, in order to maximize their viability. Uh, they can position them further forward uh, if they wanted to go after logistics uh, along the lines of what the question we had earlier was about. Uh, but that also means that there's a lot more space to search for in order to locate these key systems that you want to take off of the battlefield. Uh, and again, that becomes a, a pretty major problem uh, because of the volume of the area more than doubles uh, when the range doubles uh, because of where they can place those systems. So in order to find them, we use a variety of assets. And I'm gonna cover those very quickly. Um, so first off, uh, I mentioned counterfire radar. Uh, Russia system is the IL-220, uh, 53 uh, and both of these basically detect incoming rounds uh, and are able to give a line of bearing towards where that is. Uh, if you have multiple radars, you're able then to kind of pinpoint the location of the barrier that's shooting at you. But the range of what you're detecting depends on the system you're using uh, and then also the type of fire, uh, if it's a rocket, mortar, or if it is a regular howitzer round. We're also using UASs. Uh, up there, I have the Hermes 900. 
uh, which is an Israeli-made UAS, and that's the one we primarily use for Denovian forces uh, in our exercise. Uh, and then we have the Gray Eagles, which is the primary UAS controlled by a U.S. division, along with Shadows, which are typically pushed down to the brigade level. Um, and again, that's an overhead video capability, uh, and we've seen a lot of expansion of use in the in recent years, kind of highlighted by the, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict we saw back in September uh, and October. Uh, but again, as that range expands, uh, then access becomes an issue for these gray eagles, uh, for these UASs, because you have to fly them further, potentially into the teeth of enemy ADA, uh, which is capable. Uh, and again, having come out of Warfighter uh, at NTC uh, as a collection manager, I lost a whole lot of my four little robot drones uh, to enemy SA-17s, SA-22s, and other ADA systems that are out there. Um, so access could be an issue with seeing them. The other primary means that divisions would expect to have to be able to identify these uh, come from moving track indicators. Uh, either with a Global Hawk UAS you see in the top right here, uh, JSTAR's uh, manned Air Force platform here. Uh, and what this is, is a ground radar picture uh, that shows kind of the movement of vehicles. Uh, and so if you see in the picture here, these little dots, these are trails uh, as they're moving, moving along this path, right? So it picks it up and shows where it is moving to. Uh, and this becomes a really important tool in the counterfire fight that as we've seen in our exercises here over the past uh, really two years we've been looking at. Um, so I'll, I'll pause again for questions on kind of the systems. Uh, we're looking at that before I dive into the, the challenges that frames the making of the game. So while we're talking about UAVs and drones, uh, someone wanted to ask, how are drones and UAVs for spotting and battle damage assessment and smart shells changing the counterfire picture? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and that's something that we have struggled a lot with uh, in exercises, uh, both at NTC and during Warfighter. Uh, yeah, so drones can be good for that, uh, but a lot of it then depends on, on the access you have to the targeted area. Um, and so really it depends on the elevation you're flying at. Typically, uh, as a division collection manager, I, I kind of try to avoid using my gray eagles for that because they tend to fly uh, in the 20,000 foot mark, uh, which is susceptible to enemy ADA. I like trying to get um, higher echelon UASs or manned platforms that fly you know, 50,000 feet, 55,000 feet uh, to do the BDA, uh, but they can. And so we'll typically put in requests to get the, that collection in, uh, looking at those locations and have it pushed back down to us. Uh, the other way to do BDA, you can use the single end systems as well, but you have to make an assessment then, right? So with the MTI, obviously this isn't a literal picture of the ground you're seeing. You have to make an assessment based off of the activity. So if, for example, you were following a track along here it stops here, you shoot there, and you don't see the movement out of there again, you can make an assessment to destroy something and then try and get something with an actual picture uh, to look at it later. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. So the next question is, given the rapid rate of fire that you demonstrated uh, in some of your slides, you know, some going excess of 60 rounds per minute, what kind of strain does that put on logistics or, or the reliance on logistics for this kind of ammunition production? That puts a massive strain on logistics. Um, and I think that's something that we hand wave too often when we do these exercises is logistics aren't really thought of in, in a very deliberate manner. Uh, I know for a fact, uh, it, both at NTC and in our training system up to it, uh, we shot more rounds than exist in the Army stockpile to shoot during the course of those. Now, granted, if we're getting into a large scale war, I would expect there probably be some more rounds available, but it's really uh, an issue of planning. And this is something that, um, again, I think it, this game can get at, uh, and we left it open for that reason of, you know, again, if you're playing some two hours out, you know, as an intel professional, my job is to be able to talk both to the, the S3 and the fires guys, uh, but also the S4 and the G4, but here is the kind of ebbs and flows. Here's when we expect to need more rounds uh, because the enemy is going to be doing X or Y. And, and here's where we expect less activity out because we're going through a disruption zone or we're going into consolidation operations and we can assume some risk and movement. Uh, but then also the need to plan and supply caches. Uh, and that's something else that, again, our game doesn't have in the base rules, but could be incorporated as well to, okay, we know we're going to be moving along this rate of march. Uh, we can be more aggressive in positioning rounds behind the plot, uh, the, the forward line of troops, in order to make sure that as uh, we see our batteries move into these primary fire areas, they already have rounds to fall in on. Uh, so the next question is, did you, uh, I guess, play during your exercises 
uh, electronic detection of adversary radars and countermeasures. Uh, alternatively, did our counter battery radars get engaged slash suppressed? Or do you guys incorporate that? We do. Uh, so we, we do incorporate all the, uh, the counter battery radars. Um, typically, uh, that becomes a, a high payoff target for us. We're very much looking for the, the ILT 20s, the ones that the Denovians have in, in these uh, exercises. Uh, and so we're very aggressively looking for those using a variety uh, of sensors. And then Typically, the enemy has not been very aggressive about engaging with our Q53 radars and our counter battery radars in these. Uh, they tend to focus other areas. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure if that is just because instructions they receive or they feel there's better bang for their buck elsewhere. Uh, for now, Ben, you can keep pressing on. Okay. Uh, and so we're getting into some of these key challenges. I talked about these a little bit here already, right? So again, the range issue. Uh, we're talking about more than doubling the range of systems that has a massive impact uh, to the area on the battlefield where these could be at, right? So that's a much larger area for collection assets to search, a much larger area to try and uh, determine where they're going to position themselves. Uh, and so that puts a lot more emphasis on the intelligence preparation of the battlefield, the train analysis, uh, doing the homework in advance to identify, okay, here's where we think the enemy is going to be firing from. Um, access to targets, uh, again, that goes into the threat with the IADs. Can we get sensors over top of them to be able to see this uh, in order to recognize that this is, in fact, where they are or not? Uh, if we can't get a UAS there, what else is available? Could be the MTI piece or you sort of reliance on getting lobs off of the radars. Uh, and that goes into the ability to detect. Uh, and then finally, again, the speed of the battle, uh, again, where it's now where you plan on five minutes before to shoot where they were at, that's kind of out the window uh, with these current systems and what we're looking at. So now instead, uh, we're trying to get, instead of shooting where they're at, uh, is shooting where they're going to be. Uh, and that led us to think about uh, this game. And so the training objectives that we determined for this game, um, the importance of the sensor to shooter linkage, how are we getting the information from whatever is flying, whatever is detecting, down to the unit that is actually firing the mission. Uh, how is it taking place in a timely manner? It really emphasizing the need to pass that off. Uh, the importance of terrain analysis, of understanding what the ground looks like. Uh, again, with such a huge area to search, um, how do we rule out large swaths of territory in order to better focus uh, where our fires are gonna be going at, where we're gonna be looking at with our sensors? Survivability. Uh, again, if you're seen, you're, you're probably dead um, on this battlefield. And we saw a lot of that uh, in September, October in Azerbaijan and Armenia. And really, that's, that's largely been true since the Arab Israeli War in 73. Uh, it just happens a whole lot faster now. Um, and so we want to have the game set up so that way people learn to make sure they are doing their moves, uh, but also trying to move in perhaps unexpected ways. Um, and that thing goes into the speed of the battle, right? That, that once you're seen, you're going to get shot, um, but also that the, the fire rush should take place so quickly as to then um, effectively make it uh, that you don't have any assets available anymore rather fast uh, in this whole process. Uh, so then it's how do we tie in, uh, you know, blocking enemy sensors? How do we tie in destruction of their assets? How do we uh, make sure that we are planning when we are exposing our own assets and then going into operating without that sensor access. What happens when uh, all of our drones have been shot down uh, and when our higher echelon ISR collection is off station either ground because of weather or because it can't gain access? Uh, what do we do when we don't have eyes um, and how do we then still engage? Um, and then finally, looking at this idea of anticipation uh, versus reaction, uh, of recognizing that if we are just focusing on that point of origin uh, of where those rounds are coming from in the first place, we're doing it wrong because a smart enemy has already left there. So how do we anticipate where they're going to go? Uh, how do we anticipate where they're going to set up to begin with so that we can hopefully kill them before they fire or at least then kill them shortly after they fire as they're going off to their next firing location? Uh, and so really, this is getting very much at the importance of linking together the intelligence and the fires war fighting functions uh, from the beginning of the planning process, you know, so throughout in the MP and military decision making process, uh, the intel preparation of the battlefield, making sure we're incorporating uh, experts in both fields, experts in both areas to, to integrate and understand the problem set 
Uh, but then also as we're in operations, making sure that there's no gaps, uh, no space in that linkage between you know, your fire cell, either at Division or Devardi or down at the brigades, uh, and your Intel cells, uh, make sure they're linked in tightly and both understand what the other needs in order to function well uh, and in order to execute this. And so we, we settled on doing a tabletop game to do this, um, thinking that we could get all of these uh, through a fairly simple design. Um, and so the considerations that we had as we designed this uh, is it had to be low resource, right? It didn't, couldn't be something that took a lot of stuff to put together, couldn't take a lot of stuff to set up, um, and really shouldn't be very large because all those things make it less likely to be carried along as part of a top kit, uh, as part of something that some of his father pockets uh, and, and make use of. We want it to be fast to play. Uh, so that it was something that you could play a game of in you know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and still get that full training value out of it. We want it to be modifiable. Um, and so again, the objective that I have for it uh, and that my counterparts had for it may not be the same things a different unit has. And so making a game that would allow them to either just the train to suit their maps, uh, adjust what they want to focus on, to incorporate logistics, to uh, change the ISRS is available, to, to change the level of threat would make it a, a longer term and more valuable tool uh, over time. It needs to be realistic, um, and not in the sense of, you know, this is exactly how something would play out, uh, but sort of in a, a broad hand wavy sort of way, this is reasonable enough. It is a fair approximation uh, of what this sort of artillery bill would look like. Uh, it needed to be fun. Uh, it needed something that the soldiers enjoyed doing uh, because otherwise it's not much point in doing that as opposed to something else for training. And it was something that they would mem uh, remember and take away with them um, that once we finished the training, they would uh, take those lessons they had gained from that training with them and actually use it uh, in the exercises to come and as they progress forward in their career. And so Counterfire uh, is the game we came up with. And so what it does is it draws on the game Battleship um, in that uh, both players have a set of units. In this case, they each have three batteries uh, with a health of three. They each have a radar, uh, just a single radar, and then they have a map, and they cannot see where their opponent is placing their units, and their opponent can't see where they're placing theirs. Uh, it's turn-based in the sense that there are rounds, uh, but all actions in the rounds take place simultaneously, so everyone does get to shoot. Uh, but you plan, execute the round, and you plan the next round. It's not um, where you're just going and shouting out, uh, I'm shooting now, I'm shooting now, I'm moving now, I'm moving now. It's, it's very deliberate in the planning of it. Uh, the goal of the game is fairly simple. Uh, you are trying to destroy all the enemy artillery. Uh, so again, he hits each of the enemy's artillery batteries three times um, in order to win the game without losing all of your artillery. Uh, it was going to have employment of ISR. Um, and so we settled on providing a counterfire radar uh, as well as providing UAS uh, and uh, in some rounds, GMTI. Um, and those would operate differently depending on system we gave them when we gave them to it. Uh, and one of the variants would allow you to choose when things come on and off station in order to update an environment where, again, perhaps you don't have the assets you want all the time. Um, unlike in Battleship, pieces can move. Um, so each, each round, there is a movement phase uh, that allows you to reposition your assets uh, in order to avoid having them target in the same spot. Um, so again, we're in battleship. Uh, once you find where the ship is, its time is limited. In this game, you have the opportunity to escape depending on how well your opponent utilizes their ISR, uh, how well they look at the terrain in order to determine where you go. Uh, it does have, uh, for the base version of the game, perfect BDA, where the enemy or the opposing player will announce that um, you have destroyed you know, one unit, this is a hit, this is a miss. Uh, but uh, to one of the other questions, there is a variant of it where you have to then use your ISR assets to do BDA in order to know if you've hit the enemy or not. Um, so again, that's one of the ways it's modifiable. And then I already mentioned uh, the radar. So what I want to do now is I'm going to show you the board uh, and then kind of talk through uh, one round of the game uh, in order to give you all a sense of how it plays and what takes place on each turn. So starting off, this is what the board looks like. Um, we went with hexagons uh, in order to maximize the ability to move. Um, each hexagon is numbered. 
you know, 1 to 42 on this side and 51 to 92 on this side. Each side has the same number of hexagons. Uh, you see coloring on the terrain, right? So the crosshatch terrain like we see here in square one, uh, that terrain is severely restricted, uh, which means that a player cannot move through it. Um, so that is a, a no-go terrain. And the intent of that was to play a place where we know the enemy cannot put artillery here. Uh, and so players should know not to collect and not to shoot on grids 1, 11, 14, for example, 64, 60, and 73. Uh, the diagonal red lines you see here in this block, that terrain is restricted terrain. And so what that means basically is it stops all movement uh, as soon as you enter into that terrain. So if you're on seven, moving to two, you stop there in two. Uh, again, that is intended to shut players think about how units would move through difficult terrain uh, and then plan based off of that. So they receive fire, for example, from 92. Uh, players recognize then that the next turn, artillery could only be in one of three squares, 92, 91, or 86, because as soon as the unit moved from here to there, it has to stop. So this is basically a suicide square, uh, which I was glad that my training audience realized uh, and avoided putting things in um, almost immediately. The scores with lines in them are uh, representative roads and improved routes. Uh, this allows additional movement of the assets. So typically, a piece can move two spaces in a turn, again, unless it hits restricted terrain. Moving on a road gives one extra space of movement uh, in order to enable this. So as we're looking at the way uh, the game unfolds, the first thing you do, and this is the first step, is the planning for the turn. Uh, and so there's actions that you take. You first determine how many of your batteries you're going to fire with. Uh, each turn, each battery can fire and move in that turn. Um, there, there are reasons why you may or may not want to uh, move your batteries uh, or fire your batteries. Again, that kind of goes off to the individual play style that we're looking at. Uh, you only have to announce the decision to fire. Uh, you don't have to pick the targets quite yet. Uh, and then you also build out your movement plan that you're going to execute uh, on this turn. So again, we see here our friendly player uh, has decided he is going to uh, fire his batteries and then eventually move his batteries from eight to four. You can take advantage of Urnover to move three spaces from 26 to 37, and then 29 down here to 30. 38. I think I had a double number there. Um, in order to try and take advantage of some restricted terrain and the position of their radar here in space 38. Movement doesn't take place right away. That takes place after um, firing occurs. So the next step is ISR collection. Um, for this round, we gave them a UAV, uh, which can see three squares. Those squares have to be contiguous. Right, so it has to be something like here we see square five, four, and 10, they all touch connect, which makes that a, a good collection. Um, they couldn't do something like, for example, 37, 16, and 24. Uh, for MTI, we typically gave five squares, again, with the requirement to be contiguous. Uh, we didn't want to have them see the entire side of the board because that would just be uh, a little bit uh, game breaking for a purpose that we're trying to get across. Um, so in this turn, uh, the enemy player, Collected here, 10, 4, and 5, uh, and didn't see anything in those squares. Uh, the friendly player's collection on 65, 66, 67 did reveal the location of an enemy battery located in square 65. So step three is target selection. Uh, so again, you take the number of batteries that you said were in a fire in step one, and you allocate those now. So player one had opted to use all three of his batteries. Uh, and he's going to then fire all three of them here on square 65 in order to destroy the entirety of this enemy battery. The enemy has to plan their three shots. Um, they don't have anything to go off of beyond knowing that there is no enemy in 10, 4, and 5. So here the uh, opposing player must make the determination based off terrain analysis, based off where they think the friendly player is likely to have placed their batteries. Step four is the actual firing. 
Uh, again, so our friendly player has fired on square 65 and destroyed those units there. Uh, the enemy player fired at 27, 37, and 40, all three of which were misses at this point in time. Uh, step five is movement. And again, during this phase, you still have active ISR collection going. Um, and so players will execute along their planned routes. Uh, so when we see moving from eight up to square four here, that is seen then by the enemy's Hermes UAV, right? So he's now seen uh, the friendly moving through square 10 and stopping in square four. Uh, so that information gets provided to the opposing player and will allow them to plan fires for the next turn. Uh, all the other movement here is unobserved. Uh, as is the enemy movement as they went from 61 to 53 and 85 up to 68. Uh, radars are also targetable in this game. Uh, if a radar is hit, it is destroyed. Uh, and that means then that for the next two rounds, the uh, player who's lost the radar does not receive the points of origin for the enemy shots. So that gives you a window then to maximize your fires uh, and take a little bit of risk with how you employ your cannons forward. So I'll pause here for questions about the, the gameplay mechanics uh, before again talking about how we tested the game uh, and how we executed. So I'm gonna save the artillery focus questions for later, but in the sense of uh, what was the training audience for this game then? So the training audience were largely coming from the, the fires uh, and Intel shops, uh, both in Devardi, uh, but also in, in the G2 uh, and the G3 fires at division headquarters. Uh, so we had uh, ranks trained from uh, E4 specialists all the way up to major uh, that were taking part in this to kind of see how it work. And I think, you know, moving forward, yeah, I could see it really being used uh, for pretty much anyone that would be working inside of uh, a headquarters element that's involved in either uh, counterfire uh, or even dynamic uh, or planned targeting uh, through the fires until enterprise. And would tie with collection would also be a good part of the audience here. Uh, and I would even include that to some of the general analysts in the fusion shops as they're thinking through um, the employment of enemy fires. Um, you know, something that we, we written up in one of the articles uh, was it be a good tool for use in schoolhouses, uh, again, thinking that you know, AIT, BNOC, uh, but also OBC uh, and C. So another question is, uh, what is the effect of having a counter, bat uh, count uh, counter battery radar uh, being destroyed in your game? So that would give a, a two-round window uh, where the, the person who's lost their does not receive the points of origin for the shots. Um, so if, for example, the radar here at Square 38 was destroyed, uh, then for the next two turns of the game, uh, the red player could fire without telling the friendly player uh, where their cannon were. It would leave the, the friendly player the only, only his ISR assets then, his only uh, his shadow in this case, to figure out exactly where um, the enemy is actually sorry, Gregel. So uh, another question is, can you move your battery slash platoons individually or do they always have to move as a group? So for the, for the base game here, we keep them moving as a group, um, but that's again, where kind of the modularity comes into it. If that was something that's more of the train, uh, there's nothing stopping them from changing the rules to do that. So I know a common tactic uh, the Russians use would be to uh, have a single gun fire uh, in order to bait uh, you know, a large or disproportionate response from friendly forces. Uh, particularly we're looking at things like 35 and the Erika, that was even more feasible because again, now that one system before a large volume of fires and seemed to have a bigger signature. So while it's not part of uh, this version of the game, it's something that could easily be added into it uh, if that was uh, one of the training goals. So another sort of mechanic question is, do you have any kind of time setting for fires starting at the FO level and FFE? So we don't have much in the way of a timer set on this one. Um, again, I think that's something that people wanted to incorporate, they could, uh, but it, it's largely, you know, the time is supposed to be about a one to three minute per round uh, is like what the, the game time is. And then typically playing time is about five minutes. Uh, one, last one last question before we move on is, is there any kind of lethal burst radius for the non-classified rounds used? 
you know, so we didn't incorporate anything uh, munitions wise to, to change it. Again, we kind of wanted to keep it simple in this case where if it hits the square, it kills us on the square, uh, but only at the, the kind of one third level, one of the three systems, although I guess as it drops down, that's one of two and then one of one, uh, kind of reflecting just a, a fairly simple firing order. Uh, but again, that was something that if you wanted to incorporate, you know, MRS into the game, if you wanted to try other types of munitions, uh, you could then clearly change the effects of that. Uh, there's nothing hard and fast saying that you need to do it the way we did for this testing. So to follow up on that question is you said the time turn is about one minute per turn, correct? Correct. And then what are the distances that the hex represent? Uh, each hex is about one kilometer. Um, I think that we'll pause for questions here and then you can press on. Okay. So this was the, the framework made. This is the game that we made. Um, and so as I, I mentioned, we tested this uh, with audiences that came out of uh, initially in Devardi, uh, my S2 shop, uh, and then the, the S3 shop pulling from the, the fires, guys that are involved with the counter fire piece. Uh, but then also later sessions involved uh, personnel in one five field artillery, uh, which was the house battalion that would forward with us to uh, NTC, uh, as well as in the G2 shop division and G2 fires. This is largely because myself and uh, Major Julian Clark, the other person involved in making and testing the game, changed jobs uh, in June to where I went to the division to be collection manager and became the operations officer of an FA battalion. Uh, during this game, the first turns we had, uh, we didn't give them ISR, um, which is a little mean of us. They kind of had to stumble around blindly in order to figure out where the enemy was. Uh, but that was in order to reinforce the, the importance of that sensor shooter linkage uh, as we went along. Uh, so we incorporated uh, both field artillery and my soldiers in this, uh, sometimes in teams, having them work together, uh, sometimes playing against one another, uh, really just trying to maximize um, the amount of times it was played and the training value received from that, uh, with ranks ranging uh, from E4 all the way up to O4, uh, kind of based on who was available to us as we, as we did this. So, uh, Going back, I uh, put up here sort of the same thing, talk about the training objectives. And so I kind of want to go through these uh, as we're talking about it. So the sensor shooter linkage was one of the first ones we wanted to hit. Uh, and this became uh, something that they latched onto right away. Uh, it had a huge impact on the gameplay uh, once they learned how to use the ISR. Uh, and so at first, you know, they, the players were frequently just trying to throw it over sort of random areas, guessing at, hey, maybe something's here. Uh, as it went along, they took the information they got from the radars uh, in order to recognize that from a certain grid square, they could only go to you know, a certain number of paths and put their ISR along those paths uh, moving forward. Uh, and if they were stuck, they put along what they thought were key intersections, key routes, uh, trying to catch their opponents moving into um, those high avenues of approach, high speed avenues of approach, uh, the faster thing as they tried to move across the board uh, in order to dramatically change where they were at. And so once they were given uh, ISR, the game picked up very quickly. Uh, and the efficiency with which they used it also improved from game to game. Um, you know, so the first time they played it, uh, the, the usage of the Gray Eagles was not ideal. I mean, it was a little bit kind of jumping all over the map. But as they understood how to employ it best in order to support what they're trying to do with their fires elements, um, also, you saw them really narrow it in uh, and start destroying things a lot faster. The, the average number of turns in the game once ISR was incorporated, uh, the first game, couple games, uh, we gave them ISR around turn 10, and the game would end around turn 20, uh, which is a lot longer than we want the game to be. Um, as we improved that, you know, we gave them ISR on turn 5 in future games, and typically the game was then over by turn 9 or turn 10. Uh, so a, a very quick shift as they learned how to employ the ISR. Uh, Trade analysis and then thinking about uh, your the enemy commander uh, was another thing that was a, a big focus. Again, I mentioned the suicide square in the bottom right corner of the map um, that the players recognized uh, and brought to my attention and sort of demanded that I, I change uh, on a different map so that they could have uh, basically the same number of squares to operate in. So that was a good catch by them as they understood what the train meant to it. Uh, but then also they learned the habits of the person they were playing as well. Uh, I think one of my favorite moments as we ran this, uh, it was two captains playing. They were the, the fire direction officers that were really running the counter fire fight uh, for a time, one on day shift, one on night shift. I'm oh, sorry, for the division, on, or they've already on day and night shift. Um, and as they're playing the turn, 
I, I hear one of them, you know, kind of talking to everyone's like, I'm shooting the entire back row this time because you love to fire from the back row. Um, and the other player kind of tried to deflect that, but I, I was laughing because, in fact, uh, that next round, then there were two shots that hit on the back row, and this was before the ISR piece goes. So I don't understand how the enemy like to use terrain, uh, where they like to fire from, what kind of patterns they fell into, uh, which becomes a very big thing when we're looking at this counterfire fight and exercises as uh, the enemy would tend to reuse PAAs. And so that's something that, again, as they recognize, okay, they fired from before, this is the type of space they like to, this is kind of what we should then focus on as we're doing this was a, a huge uh, success for us coming out of this. Survivability, uh, again, driving home the point of if you're seen, uh, you are gonna get shot. Uh, if you're gonna get shot, you're probably gonna get killed. Uh, and then the need to balance your desire to destroy the enemy uh, with careful shepherding of your resources. Um, so again, early games, saw a lot of players just firing everything early on, which provide a lot of information to their opponents uh, who then use that to kill them. Um, later games, players decided to, to be a little bit more careful. Um, so at opening round, you know, when the first time they played, they would typically fire all three shots the first time. They usually only fire the minimum one required battery uh, in order to try and force their enemy to make the first mistake or allow the sensors to kind of shape what was happening with uh, identifying targets uh, and then going after them. Uh, they also became better about how they used the terrain. Uh, they didn't entirely avoid restricted terrain, which was good. They recognized that there was value in using it uh, as it could be something that was unexpected. Uh, they couldn't necessarily use it too often uh, and they had to immediately move away afterwards. And then determining when and how they move their elements. Because um, again, with the ISR assets there, there was an attic where they recognized that if they moved, their chances of being seen were increased. Um, so if you hadn't fired, then maybe it didn't need to move. Um, and so that was something that kind of came out over time. Uh, again, the speed of battle piece, uh, recognizing how fast things could turn. Uh, there were a couple of very dramatic um, shifts in, uh, in power and balance in the game where uh, a player thought they had things fairly well won, uh, won and eased up a little bit. Uh, only to have on um, three sets of turns, their batteries unified and destroyed and had them lose the game. Uh, the operating other assets piece, uh, again, this kind of goes back to that terrain analysis uh, and learning what, uh, what your enemy is going to do, what the, the opponent is going to do. Uh, and so this then allowed them to, to think through, okay, if I don't have ISR, how can I be predictive with my fires? Uh, and that's something that, again, we've been trying to implement in our exercises as well. Uh, recognizing that, do I want to do train denial? And so there was a case where one player uh, shot the same square several times in order to try and disincentivize his opponent from using a certain route so, or moving out of a certain space. Uh, and that was done fairly effectively in his game. Uh, and then again, the success of recognizing the back row piece was a big one for me that made me pretty happy to, to see them talking through that uh, and using the right terminology as they're doing so. And then finally, that anticipation versus reaction piece of you know, recognizing, that, okay, I can't fire from the poo site. Uh, I need to fire to where they're going to be going to. I need to try to identify where they're moving to. Uh, and so we saw that evolve where, again, as they got information about where the enemy had shot from, they would try and then determine the most likely place the enemy moved to afterwards, uh, where that opposing player had gone. And they did so with some success before ISR, but then really once they got uh, the Gray Eagles, they got the GMTI assets available. That had a huge impact uh, on how quickly they were able to anticipate where their opponent was going to go to um, and plan their fires accordingly off of that. So I'll, I'll pause here real quick uh, for additional questions. Uh, the next piece will about the effect of the exercises, but any questions on, on kind of the results that we saw from our war game sessions? So remembering to say um, in the unclassified realm, uh, we wanted to ask, did you use in real intelligence for the exercise uh, in the game uh, to war game the plan? So everything in the game, uh, we just took from the, the Odin site. Um, so odin.tradoc.army, actually tradoc.odin.army.mil. Um, it's got the raw equipment guide. Um, and so that's basically where we pull all the information we use as far as capabilities uh, for systems here, keeping everything very squarely in the unclassified realm because we want this to be something that people can play uh, without any concerns uh, of where they're playing it. Um, we happened to play ours uh, inside secure facilities, that's just because of where we had the space to do training. Uh, it wasn't required to be played there. Uh, however, that is something that you could do if you wanted to. Um, so we talked about 
you know, how we would draw hexes onto the maps we're going to use for NTC, uh, for Warfighter. We sort of quite got to that level because there's other things sort of took over with that. Um, but again, that's where we kind of try to make the game as modifiable as possible in order to uh, enable someone to pick it up to, to tailor it to their needs. And so uh, this one was strictly unclassified. Uh, you know, even the capabilities of the Intel or very, very rough swags of, okay, we're going to give the, the Gray Eagle three squares uh, and GMTI five squares because that seems like it, it meets the needs for balance uh, and gameplay while still driving home the lesson uh, rather than perhaps realistically depicting what those assets can do. So to sort of follow up on that, could you expand a little bit more on the connection between your uh, the training you do in the exercise at NTC and the, um, and the war game training you guys were trying to do? Yeah, so I think really we were trying to build what the board game was uh, put in a, a mentality uh, and, and a way of thinking about the problem that would then translate into the way they executed at NTC. Uh, and so it wasn't necessarily that we were trying to have the, the game itself replicate fighting the Denovians uh, in the box at Fort Irwin, uh, or there was a fairly expansive training environment we had there. I think uh, over the course of that operation between the live portion we had inside the box in Fort Irwin, uh, along with the constructive portion that we were making it a division exercise, uh, really division battle space covered uh, everything from the Nevada border uh, out just short of Los Angeles. Um, so it was a pretty big space. But really wanted them to be thinking about this problem and how they would get at the counterfire, how we would link in uh, with either their Intel or their fires counterparts uh, and the role that those warfighting functions played in this counterfire fight. Um, because at NTC, we did incorporate ERCAs and 2S35s into the simulation. Um, so that was a part of the battlefield for that, that we were testing as well. And having them think through, okay, this is how this changes the range, this is how this changes so our ability moves, um, this is how this dynamic then means that I need to pass this information right now uh, over to you know the person sitting behind the FA tabs or get this over to the uh, federal intelligence officer who's going to get it over to the um, the JAGIC floor for the Air Force to action for example. So I guess a, a related question is, did you guys use the IPB process and the fire planning process prior to the game start, or did you just toss them straight into the game? So we gave them a little bit of time to, to do IPB thinking through what the train there looked like with it. Uh, and we had already then done um, fires planning and IPB for the actual exercises that we were kind of building this off of, right? So this was part of our, our training as we were doing um, a number of CPXs, uh, Danger Gauntlets one through three in advance of NTC uh, and Danger Ready one through three in advance of Warfighter. Um, so these were a, a part of that uh, to again, build that understanding. And so we're taking the, did that into then the IPB, the train analysis, the fires plan that took place uh, to support those exercises. So another question uh, that was previous asked was, um, did you ever consider exploring a mechanic that requires the players to split their fire support or their you know, artillery assets between providing friendly fire support and doing counter battery fire? We didn't, but I really like that as, a, as something to include actually. Um, yeah, and so I think, yeah, that's fair too, of how we get the idea of, of limited assets. Um, where there's going to be multiple missions that an artillery element is going to have. Um, not everything can be reserved as part of the counter fire fight. There's going to be things that are there either in direct support uh, of the close fight to the brigades, uh, as well as executing the dynamic and the planned targets of the division in an offensive manner, uh, rather than kind of the, the natural reactive manner of a counter fire fight. So well, that was something included uh, explicitly here, um, or really thought too hard about, I think that's something that this game could be good for. So another question is, how do you deal with the new or disruptive technologies like stealthy or maneuverable rounds, iron dope type self-protection, or uh, so no scooting decoys or loitering rounds, et cetera, to see what might be of use in the future? I think that's a way again, where we can look at how we can modify this game. Um, where again, for this one, we kept it fairly simple and straightforward. Um, but I think, yeah, things where you know, rounds that are harder to detect uh, could be if you want to include a dice mechanic in the game, then where uh, if you roll, you know, six high die, a one or a two, it's detected, or, or a three up, and it's not. Uh, decoys are something that I think we probably should have included, but did not in this one. 
uh, and that certainly hurt us a little bit when we were doing Warfighter. Uh, the one watt decoys used at NTC, uh, but we did the, the Warfighter exercise last month. Um, the, the World Class Op 4 used a whole lot of decoys, uh, and we shot a whole lot of decoys over the course of this. And so um, I think we probably have to do that and find a way to uh, incorporate a mechanic with the ISR to provide multiple ints to provide the life of that asset there you're looking at. Is it is it moving? Is it emitting? Um, would be one way to do it. And then did it move after you fire? But I think, yeah, giving players a number of decoys would be an interesting way to do it. Um, and something that could certainly be added into the game. Personally, I love the idea of decoys and deception being played in this kind of game. Um, the other question is, um, have you guys ever considered adding an ammunition resupply or being the ability to hit caches and essentially trying to uh, affect different kind of uh, battlefield effects beyond just killing the launchers? Yes, we did. Um, and so that was one of the, so in the rules that wrote the game, that is actually one of the variants that we had for it. Uh, it was one that required resupply and limited number of shots that each battery had before it had to move to a either a pre-planned cache site or have a convoy come to it. Um, and again, pre-planned cache sites then could either be destroyed uh, or just watched, waiting for a unit to go to. So it's a mechanic we have thought of uh, and incorporated into one of the ultimate rules for the game. It's not one that we had players test out this one, just kind of give them a limited time for it. Uh, and there's that really focus in for our Intel analyst and our fires guy on just that sensor shooter piece. But certainly uh, logistics side is a big part of it. And something I think that would actually be sort of fun to play with this uh, in a little bit larger, more complicated setting for it. So we talked about this a little bit earlier in your lecture about incorporating, uh, incorporating systems like multiple launch rocket systems. Um, how would you on the spot sort of think about how you would incorporate that kind of system into your game? And so I think that's one where, you know, we're looking perhaps at the, the range, but also then looking more at the, the number of squares that you would destroy, right? So um, if we were playing the variant where you wanted to use 2S19s and Paladins instead, adding in uh, something like an MRS uh, or, or a Prima system with a little bit longer range on that, uh, you can have a separate band on the board then where that's where those guys are, that's where they're shooting from. But also I think if you're looking at the effects, uh, you can have them have a greater effect perhaps where, uh, you know, we may change the scale of the game to, to have each grid square represent a half kilometer or a third of a kilometer. Um, and then the MLS is able to take out three grid squares. Uh, well, it can take out one, that uh, would be the way I would do that, come off the cuff. So the next question is, um, have you considered uh, using a bigger map to allow batteries to move in support of a scheme of maneuver? This sort of goes to your notion of predictions of fire positions and uh, key terrain. Yes, that's what we think about, uh, again, as you're looking at uh, possibly expanding this in order to uh, do it on actual, you know, NTC terrain or actual warfare terrain. We didn't quite get up to that, but I think, again, there's certainly a lot of ability to just roll out a map uh, of whatever scale, probably a good one to 50, um, and then overlay hexes on it real quick. Uh, and that will give you a chance to have analysts do uh, terrain analysis on the hexes, make termination of, based on the real world terrain, uh, is the severely restricted, is it restricted, is it open, um, is there a road network? And so you can use that to have a greater train event coming into it where they're doing IFB on, on the game itself, uh, kind of in the way that I think you suggested earlier, Sebastian. Uh, and that would then have a broader scale for the units to move in. Uh, would create larger PAAs, have more shifts in the PAAs as well. Uh, and again, I think that if you wanted to, to tie in a mechanic to where you have forces moving, you know, a certain distance every turn, uh, and then require uh, you to move your artillery forward to support them, that would also be a good mechanic too, because uh, again, I think as we know that you're not going to have them in that same, same square over the course of the entire operation. They're going to have to move forward on the offense um, you know, whenever it's just to that, if we're starting the defense, we'll eventually go on the offense. And so you'd be ready to move to additional PAs a lot further forward. So I think, yeah, by expanding the map like that, given bigger space, you'd be able to more accurately model that. Again, probably the mechanic where, you know, on round one, uh, the flot is at this point, uh, the coordinating fire line is at this point, uh, and then have a rule where, you know, the artillery always has to shoot at least, you know, so many hexes beyond the CFL um, in order to make this work. 
So to sort of continue on with the ever growing questions about alterations to your game is, um, is there a way for the drones in your game to be destroyed? Like for example, IADs or jamming or other things, or have you guys considered that? So that's when we considered, uh, we didn't implement, uh, but I think it's something we would probably need to uh, in order to expand it out further. Uh, and again, I think that's one where we can look at the, you know, modify all sure and what the train objectives are for the game. Uh, so again, at NTC, uh, the, the bane of my UASs was the SA-17 uh, that shot down a number of Gray Eagles. Uh, same thing during the Warfighter. Um, lost a couple to 22s, but not nearly as many. But I think, yeah, if you wanted to expand that, you can then add in um uh, probably for you know if we have a battalion's worth of artillery there you probably want to give a couple of launchers in there so one to two sa-17 type systems to provide coverage uh, which could also then be destroyed um but then also if the OS was in a certain bubble of that uh probably probably four hexes i'd say off the cuff um then you can probably roll the dice to destroy it within that information that is shot Going back to the player, okay, the, the enemy IADs shot from here, which then makes another choice for the player to either target the IADs or to target the artillery still, uh, with one being the victory condition, but the other one being something that enables the ISR to come back. Uh, and then probably a penalty for losing a shadow or a shadow or a gray eagle of a couple of turns before it comes back on station. So I actually want to ask this myself is, why did you not use dice in your game? Was that a specific design choice or was that um, a consequence of something else? So that was a specific design choice. Um, I personally, I, I like playing games with dice and uh, some of my friends who I've seen in the audience can attest that uh, I'm terrible to play at against in those games because I will roll what I need to on command basically. Um, but I wanted for, for this version of the game, for luck to not be a major factor in it. So kind of drawing on the like, diplomacy style of game where it's about positioning your forces and then using them correctly. Uh, but again, I think a dice element can certainly be added to it. So a couple of ways we talked about it with the IADs piece, uh, with the stealth rounds, um, or if you want to change how things are damaged. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to do that as well, where you attach things to uh, that dice of, again, a roll of a one to two, or one, there's no damage. Roll of you know two to four, it's one thing taken away. Roll of five, it's two. Roll of six is catastrophic and destroys the whole thing. Or using you know beyond going D and D style with a D twenty, um, I think you do all of that too. So I'm gonna let you have a break from the questions and continue on. Okay. So again, we did this exercise uh, in the tabletop in support of uh, initially our NTC, uh, which took place in September, where 1ID was the first division to be the primary training audience for NTC rotation. Uh, but then also to kind of build on that with our Warfighter, uh, which is the typical major division exercise that we just did this past February. Um, and so we did see a couple of, of really big things come out of it. Um, so. The understanding uh, of that sense of shooter linkage was really important. Um, so GMTI Eastern exercises uh, became pretty fantastic. We started to see, um, you know, even after I left the party, uh, them very much wanting uh, and requiring some kind of GMTI feed directly in their talk, uh, which they were then using very actively in the counter fire fight. Uh, the last exercise before I left there, uh, one of my warrants uh, noticed an enemy rocket system fire from the grid square uh, and then watched them start to move. And so I challenged him uh, as you do that to take what he used here in the game and tell me, you know, how he's going to get at the targets. And so he thought through it uh, and told me he was going to take our average fire mission processing time, which at that point was about four minutes, uh, and figure out where they were going to be in four minutes and put the mission to shoot at that location. Um, and so the fire mission went off, but it landed in four minutes. So we were on average time with that one. Um, and it was right on where the dot had stopped. Now, unfortunately, because it's a simulation um, and the sims don't always play the way we like them to play, uh, we took fire from the location about 30 seconds later. Uh, but had it been real world, it would have destroyed everything in that grid square uh, and killed that unit. Uh, again, in part because of what he did here. Uh, communication between Devardi and G2 uh, during the NTC Warfighter was fantastic. Uh, you know, as the collection manager, uh, the person I took the most calls from during both exercises was my replacement as the Devari 2, uh, followed closely by some of the guys in the Devari fire cell. Um, 
as they're asking for assets, asking to make sure we're getting the sensors to them quickly. Uh, then internally inside the G2, building that linkage between our analysts who are the ones who are watching the Gregel feed, who are doing the MTI, uh, and that field artillery intelligence officer who is our link inside of our ACE out to the broader fires world, uh, of them recognizing the, the timeliness uh, and that's importance. And then again, getting some of that predictive analysis in there as well. Um, so the intel analysts knowing the timelines they needed to follow, uh, knowing how quickly information had to pass, uh, led to a dramatic increase in uh, how effective we were at engaging targets uh, throughout the battlefield. Uh, the predictive fires, uh, understanding that there, there are times when you know, assets aren't available. Uh, there are a number of cases, both in Warfighter and NTC, as well as in our leader exercises, where um, we decided to conduct fire missions against likely locations, uh, and we peeled back uh, some of the, the media later on. We found out that we had, in fact, hit targets that were there. Uh, based off of the assessment of the analysts uh, paired with that fire's expertise. So really getting the sort of the reverse warfighter function uh, knowledge in there, understanding again how the enemy likes to fight uh, was huge in that. Uh, earlier today, uh, when I was you know finishing up the, the preparations for this, I walked back around, talked to some of the players, um, and we hadn't run a game probably in about five months at this point. So it's been a little bit um, but I just asked him, hey, what did you get from that game that we did? And this is pretty vague. Uh, but then, you know, both people I asked immediately responded with all the major training decks from the game uh, came across uh, immediately. They still remembered what came out of the training events. Um, and so for me, that's a big part of the story. It was as memorable to them. They understood, okay, this is what it's trying to do. And then they retained that, um, that they understood that, okay, uh, this was the objective of what we were doing with this game. Um, this is what I took from it. Uh, again, going back to the sense of the shooter, importance of the IPB, importance of the assets availability, uh, importance of survivability. Uh, and they could you know, get that back to me verbatim months after having played the game, um, but tying it to experiencing that. And I think really it goes something that, that comes up a lot of these forums, right? Is uh, how important it is to get investment uh, in training, right? And so I think war games. Uh, are really easy to build that investment because you are there and you're the one that is making these decisions and you get immediate feedback uh, on these decisions that you're making, right? It's either right or it's wrong uh, and you know fairly quickly. So in my game, you know, because uh, you're blowing up your enemy or it blows you up and within 20 minutes, you have a pretty good sense of, okay, uh, I either had this down or I don't and then a pretty good intuitive of why uh, you failed or succeeded. And so I think that's the real strength uh, of things like this uh, that, you are there, you're playing it, you're making decisions. Um, and in doing so, then you're going to remember because it was you as a key part of the narrative that's built around the training events. Uh, you are the central figure in it. Uh, and I think we tend to remember things where we are the central figure uh, a lot better than things where we're sitting back watching a PowerPoint or sort of tangentially involved uh, in a broader event that we don't necessarily understand the full scope and scale of. So uh, they really recognize the entirety of what's going on. Uh, the, the personal investment in it, I think, made it a lot better. Uh, and so training that can capture this, and again, war games do, uh, is beneficial and something we can do uh, pretty easily long-term. Uh, so the last piece I have is a bonus one uh, of another way that we incorporate um, war game mechanics uh, into some of the things that we do here in 1ID. So, uh, you know, for those familiar with the military decision making process, war gaming is an explicit step of that process, um, but it's less about uh, trying to figure out if you're going to win or not, it's going to be from your enemy because by the time you get to working a plan, the plan is supposed to already be one that will succeed. Uh, and so it's not about then uh, pointing out where it's going to fail. It's about making sure that assets are in the right place, uh, that you're ready for contingencies, identify where branches and sequels will be, identifying what decision points they're going to be for the commander. Uh, and so one of the things we have done to sort of help with the wargaming of this is incorporate dice. Uh, so to Sebastian's point earlier on, and, and my love of dice. Um, so when I'm playing enemy commander, uh, what I'll typically do for these is I'll build a table, like I'm a dungeon master, uh, and roll dice each turn to determine the number and type of actions I take, where uh, if it's a one, oh, well, I had a terrible roll, and therefore not a lot of bad things happen to the friendly plan on that particular round of the war game, uh, or roll 20, uh, there's a whole lot of bad things coming down. Um, and me being me, it's usually a lot closer to the, the 20s on that. Uh, but that is what I have. And so I'll move on to any final questions. And I thank everyone for, for listening to me talk for the last hour and 15 or so. So 
One question is, did you experiment with RIN orders passed through staff to make the game harder? Sorry, is that one time, please? Did you experiment with RIN orders being passed from staffs to make the game harder? We did not. So that's an interesting sound dynamic, actually, of, of having things get lost in translation or, or the ambiguity that comes with that. So uh, we didn't, but I'd be curious to see how it would work with it, actually. So another question is, a lot of people were impressed by your simple yet elegant game design. Um, but one of the questions was, have you ever considered making this like digital um, with the notion of like collecting data from how players advance through the game? Yes, yeah, so we, we tried to keep some records out as we're going along, um, but we were doing it analog at the time. And so uh, I have uh, a stack of, of notes uh, of each round, but but yes, I think it'd be pretty easy to do digitally. There is a, a digital file for it. Um, Dr. Bay was kind enough to actually make the icons for me uh, as I was building this game out. So they're, they're really good looking icons you saw there are his work. Um, and I think if you just do it with an Excel sheet, uh, it'd be really easy to track then all that activity goes there. So in the, the digital PowerPoint that has all the files for the game, there is now a, a tracking sheet. And I think I'd probably like to go back and build one again, more likely in Excel so I can build a little more formulas to determine uh, success rates and failure rates uh, of both the fires and the collection piece. So the, another question is, um, did you receive feedback from the OCTs about the unit performance during uh, due to the use of this tool? Like, was there any com uh, feedback from that exercise portion? Uh, no, because we didn't really talk to the OCTs about having used the game. So I, I wish I had thought of that actually at the time, uh, but it was something that just so I got lost, unfortunately. So I guess following up on the theme of questions of how you would expand or um, add to this game, what were th some design choices that you wanted to, to include in the beginning, uh, but you decided to leave it uh, leave it out, and for why? There's there are, there are a couple of them. Um, you know, so initially I thought about incorporating more ISR assets, um, but then dropped them because of classification concerns. Uh, I didn't want to have a game that would uh, even risk touching on the secret or beyond level for that. So uh, keeping with things that are pretty squarely uh, in the unclassified realm and in common knowledge realm too. Um, it was also recognized that the more complicated I got down that range, the more intel specific I got, uh, the less base knowledge there would be as well. Uh, and that would probably confuse some players uh, off the bat. And, Really wanted to be fairly simple to pick up from the beginning. Uh, scale was another one. Uh, you know, I'm still tempted to try and expand this out to incorporate more maneuver uh, and, and see if we can link in Intel fires and maneuver because I think that's one thing where, you know, coming out of ARs for both NTC and Warfighter, uh, there were times when our you know Intel fires piece was really tightly done, really well integrated, uh, but we sort of lost the kudos bit and we're doing too much of focusing on. Well, these targets we planned, these targets we're shooting, um, as opposed to recognizing that this is the way the battlefield changes. And so I think uh, tying it into the question from earlier on, I would have liked to have, and thought about incorporating a mechanic where, you know, things happen with the maneuver that then force changes the fire plan, um, but just didn't really get into to writing those rule sets yet, um, but may go back to that in the future. Uh, so those are the two big ones. Uh, again, logistics was when we do have the additional rules for uh, I would like to play test that a little bit more. We just didn't have the time, and I didn't think been too bringing in uh, more uh, and broader war fighting functions as well. So, of course, everyone who played this is either an intel or a field artillery professional. Uh, I would have liked to have gotten some maneuvers to touch it. Would have liked to have gotten uh, some some logies to touch it as well. Uh, thought a little bit of the communications piece uh, about ways to disrupt the fires net. Uh, I couldn't really think of a good mechanic uh, to do that simply though of of then how, if, you know, because there's a lot of ways that you can attack this, you know, integrated fires networks, right? So you can attack the ISR asset, you can attack the cannons, you can attack the radars, you can attack the command nets. Um, and so there are a few ones that we thought about incorporating, but just got left off because I, I, we couldn't think of a, a non-complicated way to, to put that into the game. So one of the suggestions in the chat was to use card injects or use cards as a way to simplify some, some of the more complex stuff. Uh, I'm a big fan of cards and designs for simplicity. Um, they put a lot of 
pressure on the designer in terms of prepping cards and making nice cards, but it does increase a lot of the playability and robustness for the player end. Um, but also at the same time, this is not your full-time job. So um, another- no, I like that idea a lot though, because I think you, know, you build a deck um, and just each turn a player draws one or two cards and it can be a variety of things. So some will do nothing, some will be negative, some will be positive, but that, that'd be a good way to inject a little bit more randomness into the game um, and force, force changes to gameplay. So I think that could definitely be a positive. Yes. Uh, so one of the burning questions in the chat is, is this PowerPoint slash game available to download? Um, I need to find a place to host. I think I have it as a PowerPoint, but I want to put it into a Google Doc. Uh, I am happy to email to anyone who, who asked me for it. It's uh, uh, ben.griffin at utexas.edu. Uh, I'll send out that way. And we have submitted it to the Philatory Bulletin as an article and game for hopeful publication in the future, uh, but really need to get something up there as a Google Doc for people to be able to pull it offline. Uh, so that will hopefully come in the future. Hey Ben, uh, one thing we can do um, is that if you send it, you, if you send me the latest version, I have, I think I have one of your earlier versions. Um, I can post it with this PowerPoint slide deck to our Goose um, Drive, um, okay. and everyone should be able to access it. Yeah, I'll get that um, to you tonight. All right. So uh, another question is: To what extent, if any, did first ID simulation operations officers or the Fort Riley Mission Training Complex staff assist or support your efforts in developing or using this game? Um, so we, we didn't touch them. We probably should have. So that's a resource we have to decide. I talked about it briefly with our Division Sins guy, um, but he had a lot of other projects in his play at the time, and I wasn't going to try and add to his work. Um, but I think going forward, that would be a good place for us to try and, and get extra expertise on it. Um, because, yeah, they, they have a lot of capability, a lot of tools that probably would have made the game a lot better that we just didn't touch. So along those lines, how did your command or your unit or your leadership respond to you using this game or developing this game for training? It was very favorable. Um, yeah, so the, the Devardi commander uh, has a lot of trust in, in his staff uh, as we were building this out. Uh, and you know, so he was on board with it uh, as well as the, the rest of the senior staff. And so it got a, a pretty warm reception as we're going through and doing it. Uh, same thing with the, the G2 when I was talking to him about doing this um, and why he thought it was a good idea. And so it was something different and interesting, but certainly they were willing to experiment and try. And I think the, the results were worth it. So could you remind us again how the counter battery radars worked in your game? Yeah, so um, the base version of the game is that the radars are always on and functioning perfectly. Uh, and so they provide the, the player with the exact point of origin for each of the shots the enemy takes at them. Uh, if the counter battery radar is destroyed, uh, then there is a two turn penalty where the player no longer receives information on enemy shots. So I'm looking through for any more questions is, ah, would, would the game have the same training value if it were adapted for solo play against a bot opponent or is it a, um, or do you think the head to head duel has a vital component to the game's training value? Um, I mean, I think the value is still there uh, in order to make it work. I, Someone else got to program the bot because that is well beyond my capabilities uh, to do. Um, but yeah, I think certainly if you're doing a single player version, uh, that, that's definitely feasible. Uh, I, I do like the head to head piece just because you know, at times you got people talking trash back and forth, which is fun. Uh, but yeah, I think certainly uh, individual play would still work. Assuming someone good coded it, and that's not me. And uh, one of the questions from uh, one of my favorite people, James Starrett, is that he, uh, he wanted to ask if you were able to travel to Fort Leavenworth between June 22nd and June 25 to demonstrate this game at Connections Wargaming Conference. Um, I would love to. Uh, let me take a look at that and see if that's feasible. I'll connect you to James is one of my favorite people um, in the gaming industry. And do we have any other questions for Ben before we press on? Ah, uh, are there any other memorable head-to-head -head or uh, moments that you've seen when players have been playing your game? Um, yeah, so I mentioned the one with the fires in the back row. Uh, 
the other one where someone decided to to try and you know slow walk it into the end zone and had the tables turned quickly. Uh, you know, I in one of the sessions too, they they kind of prevailed on myself and, and um, Dwayne Clark to play is the creators of the game to see how it works. Um, and I think even without the ISR, uh, wiping the fourth and four turns was kind of fun. Um, but that's just uh, a little bit of luck on my part, actually. Uh, other other things that were great that I really liked taking out of it, uh, what was the player who made really good use of restricted terrain, actually, um, and just had his opponent furious that he kept firing restricted terrain. Um, and then at times actually did not make survivability moves afterwards. Um, and so watching someone just had their jaw drop as a player fired from the same piece of terrain on consecutive turns because they hadn't even said as a possibility uh, was another good learning point that came out of it. Do you plan to make a version two, either a heavily expanded advanced version of the game or slight alterations that add, but keep uh, a lot of the simplistic uh, yet elegant design of your game? All right, so based on how the comments got here, actually, I think I'm going to write some more ultimate rules in the very near future to try and expand this. Um, we'll see about the card piece, because I like that idea. I just got to think of, of what they all will be. But yeah, so uh, as I look over the next couple months, I'll probably try and make a second version to incorporate some of these great ideas that have come out of the chat, actually. So that's why I'm, I'm glad to be able to crowdsource some of this. So I'm going to um, stall for a few more minutes. If anyone has any last minute questions for Ben, otherwise we may call it a night uh, a bit early. But um, Ben, I want to thank you again for providing us your expertise and a great glimpse at how um, wargaming can be used for training and ed ed education at the tactical unit, uh, which I think is absolutely awesome. Um, so I don't see any last minute questions. So thank you again, Ben. I'm, we hope to see you uh, more involved in the wargaming community. And thank you very much for hosting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out tonight to listen to me talk and giving great suggestions.